Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, again today. I want to start, as always, by updating you some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 14,117 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 188 since yesterday. A total of 1,480 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is a decrease of 54 since yesterday. A total of 71 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected uh, cases of the virus. That is an increase of one since yesterday. Uh, I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,253 patients who had tested positive and been hospitalised have now been able to leave hospital, which is obviously very positive news. Unfortunately, though, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 34 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2007. And let's always remind ourselves, uh, because I think it's really important that we do, that behind these statistics are individuals whose loss is a source of grief to their friends, family and loved ones generally. And I want to again today send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers. Uh, later this evening, people across the country will yet again applaud from our doorsteps and windows. And I hope that that gesture gives a small, symbolic, but nevertheless important indication of how deeply grateful all of us are to all of you for the incredible work that you are doing. I have three things I want to uh, briefly update on today. Uh, the first is, is on testing, and I want to take the opportunity today to set out again so that it is, is clear who is eligible right now to access testing. Uh, but before I do that, let me stress that we keep this under uh, constant review and uh, take clinical advice on an ongoing basis. And as we make changes to testing eligibility, we will, of course, set these out. But I want to set out clearly the position as it is now uh, so that no one who is entitled uh, to be tested is in doubt about that. Uh, NHS Scotland testing capacity is currently used within hospitals for all intensive care patients, uh, all patients in hospital who have symptoms of the virus and all those who are admitted to hospital who are over the age of 70 whether they have symptoms of the virus or not. Uh, people who are over 70 will be tested every four days during their stay in hospital. And the reason for that, of course, as we see in the statistics that we publish every day, older people are particularly hard hit by this illness. NHS tests are also given to all patients due to enter or re-enter a care home from hospital. And if they have previously tested positive for the virus, they must have two negative tests before entering the care home from hospital. In addition, we are implementing now what is called enhanced outbreak investigation in all care homes where there are any cases of COVID. And this involves testing, subject, of course, to individuals' consent, uh, all residents and staff, whether or not they have symptoms of the virus. NHS testing is also available for all NHS and social care key workers or symptomatic household members of those workers. And this testing should be accessible to care and health service staff within their local area and should not require them to drive or, or travel long distances. Care home managers can put symptomatic staff forward for testing. And let me stress, there should be no barriers uh, to that whatsoever. Uh, tests are also now available to a wider group of people through the UK-wide testing programme at drive-in centres and mobile testing units. There are five drive-in centres in Scotland. These are at Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen airports and in Inverness and Perth. There are also now 12 mobile testing units across the country in locations such as Annan and Fort William, and they will move to other towns every five days or so. These provide testing for any key worker with symptoms, not just health and care workers. So, for example, if you're working in critical infrastructure services and they're also available for anyone uh, who needs to work and cannot work from home and for anyone with symptoms who's over 65. Testing is also available to symptomatic household members for all of these groups. And if you book a test through these drive-in or mobile centres, you'll be allocated to the centre closest to your own postcode. Now, I do understand that for some people that can still involve travelling 
quite a long distance. So we're working with the military to try to make mobile testing units as widely available as possible. Um, finally, as I've covered uh, before, we're also now using uh, testing capacity for monitoring purposes to test the prevalence of the virus in communities across the country. And as we further increase our testing capacity and as the incidence of the virus continues to reduce, we will also start implementing our policy of test, trace, isolate and support. Uh, that will be crucial to uh, controlling further outbreaks of the virus as we start to emerge from lockdown and we will be updating on progress with that uh, very shortly. However, at this stage, our testing policy continues to be based on three key priorities, saving lives uh, and protecting the vulnerable, uh, ensuring that critical staff can return to work as soon as possible, and lastly, monitoring and reporting on the spread and prevalence of the virus. The continuing expansion of testing is enabling us to do that more effectively while also building our capacity to test, trace and isolate. The second item I want to update you on relates to support for people who are shielding. Uh, and let me remind you that that term shielding refers to, in Scotland, approximately 175,000 people who are at the highest clinical risk from COVID-19 and who have therefore been asked to stay at home at all times. People who are shielding can ask for support and receive information through a text messaging service. And if you've not re yet registered for the service, but you are in that shielding group, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, one of the services that you can request by text is free weekly delivery of food and other vital provisions such as toiletries. These deliveries are also available to people without a mobile phone and I'll read out in a few uh, moments the free phone number which will be useful for you if you are in that position. More than 50,000 people who are shielding have so far signed up for this free delivery service and let me stress it is free uh, delivery of food and uh, so far more than a quarter of a million of these free food packages have been delivered to people across the country. In addition, many supermarkets are making priority delivery slots available for people in the shielding category. Uh, I know uh, for some of you, as you enter your seventh or eighth week now of shielding, you will be feeling incredible levels of frustration. And I think it's really important for all of us to recognise that this crisis is in so many ways much harder for you, even than it is for those living with the standard restrictions that are in place right now for all of us. And so it's really important to me that you know support is available to you and that support will be available for as long as it is needed. Uh, please ask for that support if you need it. Uh, whether it's food and medication or indeed anything else. Just because you haven't uh, needed it up until now and you may not have registered for that service doesn't mean you cannot ask for it at any time. Uh, I also want you to know, and this is also really important to me, that you do know this, that you're not being forgotten about as we think about our next steps in tackling this virus and about how we adapt to living with a new normal uh, where this virus will be present for a long time your needs and your quality of life remain really important uh, to our decision-making process and really important to our thinking. Uh, we will set out steps over the, the days and weeks to come about how we do emerge from the lockdown right now, but I don't want anybody in the shielding group to think that you uh, are being left behind. You have particular needs and it's really important that we protect you, but it's also important that we understand how difficult this is for you. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have a national helpline for people who are shielding. Uh, this will direct you to your local authority and it's a good way of finding information about all of the support that's available to you, including food and medicine deliveries. And it's particularly helpful for those who uh, don't use the, the text messaging uh, service. So the number is 0800 111 4000. That's 0800 111 4000. The line is open between 9am and 5pm every weekday, so please do uh, feel free to make use of it. Uh, the final issue I want to briefly uh, cover is the work of Skills Development Scotland. I know that the economic uncertainty caused by this crisis, and in particular the measures we've had to take to tackle this virus, has caused very many people to worry about future job prospects. 
Although um, it can't currently offer face-to-face -face support for obvious reasons, Skills Development Scotland has still been providing help to people throughout the crisis. For example, its website, My World of Work, provides information on online learning courses, on jobs that are immediately available, and on practical skills, such as updating or developing your CV. Uh, yesterday, Skills Development Scotland expanded its support further by launching a phone line and online service. And again, I'm going to read out the phone line number uh, in a couple of moments. The phone line and web resources will provide people with access to a range of services that SDS has available and also services that are provided by local councils. So this will help individuals who are thinking about future job and career options. For example, if you're currently on furlough, if you've been made redundant and are seeking employment, or if you're a school pupil or the parent or carer who's thinking right now about what you might want to do after school. An advertising campaign was launched yesterday to support this enhanced service. So if you think you might benefit from the advice being offered, uh, either go on to the Skills Development Scotland website, which is myworldofwork.co.uk, or phone the helpline, which is 0800 917 8000. 0800 917 8000. Uh, I want to conclude today before I hand over to the Health Secretary uh, simply by emphasising once again our key public health uh, guidance uh, because it is still important. The stay at home message in Scotland is the one that we want everybody still to hear at this stage uh, and that is please stay at home except for essential purposes uh, and that could be essential work that you can't do from home, uh, going out for exercise or to pick up food and medicine. Uh, you can, of course, now exercise more than once a day, but when you do leave the house, stay more than two metres away from other people and don't meet up with people from households other than your own. Please wear a face covering if you can, uh, if you're in a shop or in public transport, and don't forget to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And finally, if you have symptoms of the virus or if somebody in your household has symptoms, then you should stay at home completely. You should not even go out for the essential purposes that I've mentioned. Uh, this is, as I say every day, and every day I say it, it becomes more and more true. This is really difficult, and it does get more difficult with every day that passes. But right now, it is still necessary, and it is making a difference. By staying at home, we are continuing to slow down the spread of the virus and reduce the number of new cases of it that we are seeing every day. Uh, we're protecting the National Health Service as the numbers on hospital admissions and ICU uh, demonstrate. And notwithstanding these really horrible, grim figures I still read out to you every day, we are undoubtedly saving lives. Uh, and we are also bringing the day closer uh, when we can start to ease these restrictions and get back to some kind of normality. So uh, my thanks again to all of you for continuing to do the right thing uh, for your own sake, but for the sake of everybody else as well. This truly is a national collective endeavour uh, that all of us are contributing to. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to the Health Secretary, who will say a few words, and then uh, she and I and the Chief Medical Officer will take questions. Thank you very much, First Minister. I wanted to briefly address today's media report surrounding Home Farm Independent Care Home in Portree. Uh, I know this is of significant interest to the local community and to the wider public. Our thoughts remain with the residents, families and staff affected by COVID-19, not just at Home Farm in Skye, but also in all residential care settings. The Care Inspectorate carried out an unannounced inspection of Home Farm on Tuesday of this week. Following that inspection, NHS Highland has agreed with HC1, the owner of that care home, to provide enhanced assistance by deploying additional NHS resources including social care management, nursing leadership and direct care. This additional support has come into, eff into effect immediately with the aim of improving and sustaining the right quality of care for the residents. I remain directly engaged with the developments at Home Farm to ensure that we continue to act as necessary for the well-being of residents and staff. The Care Inspectorate have not yet published their inspection report, so it is not appropriate for me to comment any further on the details of the case at this point. However, I can say that I and the Scottish Government strongly support action to ensure that all care homes provide a safe home 
for their residents. We have in Scotland a robust inspection regime for our care sector. That is why the Health Board and HC1 have been able to agree these interim arrangements very quickly following the inspection on Tuesday. I will continue to keep you updated uh, as appropriate on this issue, which I know is of great importance to all of us. And the final uh, point related to care homes that I want to make at this stage is to advise you that updated COVID-19 national clinical and practice guidance on care homes has been revised and that that revision, uh, which ensures clarity, for example, on testing requirements for admission to care homes and for those homes uh, with an active COVID-19 case, that that updated guidance will be published by tomorrow, the 15th of May. Thanks very much, Health Secretary. And I'll move straight to questions now. First, uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, um, the national records for Scotland figures uh, for the south of Scotland show lower death rates per head for the Priest in Galloway and for the Scottish borders, which is obviously very good news for people down there. There's also been a briefing today from NHS Dumfries and Galloway that puts an R number for Dumfries and Galloway at 0 0.75 compared to, that was on the 8th of May, compared to a higher number for Scotland as a whole. Um, if you argue that Scotland should be able to follow its own course, is there not a strong case for parts of Scotland be able to follow their own course? That would mean, for example, hospitals in the south of Scotland going back to some routine operations and possibly even easing restrictions there before the rest of Scotland? Um, as you'll recall from uh, being a, a regular attender at this uh, daily briefing, I've never ruled out um, regional variations if, if both the evidence backs up that kind of approach and we, we judge that they can be implemented in a practical and, and under, clearly understandable uh, way. Uh, so we don't, we don't rule that out, although we are not at this stage uh, proposing that kind of uh, regionally uh, varied approach within Scotland. Um, one of the things that there's also uh, some of you on this call will have uh, taken part in a, a technical briefing with the, the Scottish Government's chief statistician this morning about how the, our number is calculated. And I, I suspect that one of the points that will have been made there is that when I talk about the, the range of the R number, I, I often talk about the, the confidence intervals in that and the uncertainties. And uh, I, I suspect one of the points that will be made at that briefing is that the more you try to regionalise that, the more uncertainty uh, you will have. Because one of the key uh, ingredients in calculating the, the R number is, is numbers of deaths. And as you get down to uh, smaller geographic uh, areas, with lower numbers of deaths and perhaps even relatively lower numbers of deaths, that just makes the, the certainty of an R number uh, even more uh, difficult to be uh, sure about. Uh, in terms of the, the R number, and we may uh, come on to this a little bit, the R number is really important and some of the steps were taken. So lockdown has brought R down. Um, some of the steps we're taking now to get it down further are the steps were taken in care homes and hospitals. Of course, compliance with lockdown is still really important to keep it uh, down. But the relationship between R and the incidence of the virus, the number of new cases we see every day, is, is what is of crucial importance. Because if we have a low incidence, then in short, we can perhaps cope with a slightly higher R number, although it still needs to be below one, uh, than we could if we had a high incidence. The problem now across Scotland is that we still have and our number and an incidence that are too high for us to uh, meaningfully at this stage ease up on lockdown. But that is something obviously that is under ongoing uh, monitoring. And we, we will monitor that at a Scotland wide basis. But to end where I started in, in relation to your question, if the, the evidence leads us to things that to, to think that things could be done on a regional basis. We've never ruled that out, but we'd obviously have to consider the practical implications of that as well. And my final, final point in terms of hospital provision, we are looking, and the Health Secretary might want to say a word about this, we are looking uh, as uh, right now at how quickly and in what phasing we, we start to resume hospital procedures that had been postponed because of COVID, uh, and we're looking at that right across Scotland um, and because we want to do that as quickly as possible. Do you want to say a word of that, Jean? That work has, has begun. I think we touched on it very briefly at a previous briefing. Uh, so all our boards are now actively engaged in looking at 
uh, what are the areas of healthcare that we've paused right across the healthcare system, so from primary care through outpatients to care that requires hospitalisation that could uh, be restarted, that has already been paused, that does incorporate our screening programmes too. Uh, we're engaged with the Royal Colleges and with the unions representing uh, staff in uh, healthcare as well about their views. There are complexities in this because we need to make sure that we retain capacity to deal with COVID-19 cases, including if there is an increase in the number of those cases. And we have some interdependencies in what we can restart that is based on other decisions that we will take as a government around issues, for example, of public transport and travel. So it's a complex piece of work, but we are actively engaged in it because we do recognise the harm that uh, will have been caused by, uh, to, to health of individuals having to wait longer than they would otherwise do for those non-urgent but nonetheless very important uh, procedures and areas of healthcare. So we are working our way through that as soon as it is possible for us to give an indication of the range of options that we're looking at, then we will make that uh, public and we will uh, begin uh, to narrow that down to what we think in a safe way are the areas of healthcare that we can restart. I think Gregor wants to say a quick word as well before we move on to the next question. Thank you, Minister. I, I really just wanted to, to kind of say this. This I get very uneasy when I hear um, our numbers being asserted with confidence around a, a single point. Just just now in the, in the message, I, I want to get across um, really clearly to your colleagues and, 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 and to others is, is that when, when we hear an R number, which is a single point in time, which is asserted with that degree of confidence, we, we should treat it with caution. Um, because it's the range of our numbers that we should be, be um, kind of be concentrating on at this precise moment in time, but particularly in this instance when it's on a small geographical area like this, because the degree of confidence with which we can see that that number is correct is, 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 really, is really rather low. Thanks, Gregor. Just to say there is a range in that document, uh, which I could have quoted but didn't, but there sure. was a range in that document. I think, for, sure, for and I, I've not... Yeah. I've not seen that document. I'll, I'll no doubt see it later on. But but the, the same, I think the same point applies even to a range. The the smaller your geographic area, uh, the greater the level of uncertainty will be in that number. So that that's just a, a general point to make. Um, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. We're running a, a story today about Renaissance Care. They've had mass testing of all staff and residents in eight of their care homes. And they found that, on the back of that, 11% of non-symptomatic or asymptomatic residents, residents uh, were actually positive for COVID. 6% of staff were positive. There's a study from Cambridge University that also indicates there's a, a percentage value in testing people without symptoms. In the spirit of, of constant review, will you revise or reassess your view that the testing of people without symptoms is unreliable? Um, so we are testing asymptomatic people now. Um, in care homes right now, if there is a, a, a case of the virus in a care home, all staff and residents will be tested regardless of whether or not they have symptoms. So we are moving into asymptomatic testing. Gregor and I have been discussing this morning uh, whether uh, we should be extending that even further. So as I said earlier on, we keep all of that under review. I, I suppose what I, in, in response to your question, um, and I'll bring Gregor in as the, uh, the, the person here who's much more expert on, on the clinical aspects of this, obviously, than I am. But we have always said, and, and I would still say, because it's the advice I'm given, that the test is most reliable in a window where somebody has symptoms. Uh, and I think that is still the, the position we would take. So I think there has to always be a caveat when you're testing asymptomatic people that it is not as reliable at that stage, which is why, and you'll have heard me say this uh, many times before, while testing is important, we mustn't place uh, an over-reliance on testing alone. So if you are recognising that, particularly with an asymptomatic 
person it is not as reliable as it might be in other circumstances. For example, say that's a resident um, being admitted to a care home, it is still really important that isolation takes place and the infection prevention and control is properly implemented. So, uh, you know, that's the position we've we've articulated. It's the position I think uh, we would still articulate, but in practice, we are expanding testing to more groups of asymptomatic people. Gregor, do you want to? Yeah, I, mean, I think we've got to be very clear about what we mean by reliable, and there's a very there's a difference between um, also between usefulness and reliability uh, as well. Uh, and one of the clear things that we know about this test is that it's not reliable in the asymptomatic period. Now, the test works because it detects viral particles, and that's what it picks up and that's what it shows. And when those viral particles are shown in the presence of symptoms, we know that there's a very good chance that th those people could be shedding virus and um, being able to pass that on to other people. What we don't know with any degree of certainty yet, the evidence just isn't there to be able to tell us, although it's increasing, but what we don't know is in that pre-symptomatic phase, what is the significance of a positive test? Because as I say, all it does is it might pick up some sort of RNA material that the viral uh, has shown is present. It doesn't tell us whether that individual is actually infectious or not. Now, our understanding about that is increasing all the time. The test still isn't reliable in that period, but I think that it may become increasingly useful to be using that type of test in the period as we understand more about this evidence and how to manage those people who come positive. I mean, a general point I would make is, um, whether it's on testing or anything else, our positions uh, will adapt as the evidence and, and the knowledge of this virus develops. This is a virus, I've said this before as well, that is still, well, what is it now, 150 days old. Uh, we are learning literally every single day uh, things about how this virus behaves, how it operates, what conditions it uh, spreads most aggressively in. And one of the things that has been developing is our knowledge around uh, the, the ability of people who are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic to shed virus. So we are not stuck in positions here. We, we need to adapt as we learn more. Um, so yes, we are uh, testing more asymptomatic people. I suspect that will extend even further, but I think it's really important that we are frank about the, the uh, relative reliability of the test in these uh, different circumstances. Of course, the other news today around testing is an, on antibody testing, which uh, is, is positive news that there is a, a test that has uh, achieved uh, a high degree of reliability. But again, that is not the whole story because we still don't know uh, what the what the implications of somebody having an antibody response to this virus is. Does it mean you've got immunity? And if it does mean you've got immunity, how long does that immunity last? So we are learning all of the time, which is why we have to remain as flexible as possible in how we, we tackle this. Uh, Louise Scott from STV. Um, just have a, a couple of questions on the home farm care home that the health secretary um, mentioned earlier. We're just wondering whether these changes that have been implemented, are they short term or long term changes? And can you offer any further update on the longer term prospects for the care home and its residents? And what assurances can you give the residents and families that their needs will be met in the future? So, just want to do that. so it, it is impossible at this point to say that there is a definite end uh, to the current situation. The assurance that uh, I can give to the residents and to their families and indeed to the community of Skye is that the National Health Service will remain actively engaged in the care and support of residents in that care home for as long as we deem it necessary to ensure that effective infection prevention and control is being practiced, that the right staffing ratios are there, and that the residents are receiving the, the quality of care that we think that they should be, save, be receiving. Thank you. Um, Peter Smith, ITV News. Hi. Hi there, First Minister. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask about, just in terms of that learning as we go, um, in the initial stages of the outbreak here in Scotland, we, as across the UK, contact traced people if they'd been closer than two metres 
for um, 15 minutes with someone. Um, we know more now about how the virus transmits, and we know that other countries at that same time, like South Korea, for example, they were contact tracing anyone who was in the same building with someone with COVID, if they'd been in the same cafe or the same restaurant. That model seems to be very effective in contact tracing. When we move forward into the next stage, when there'll be a lot more contact tracing rolled out in Scotland, are you going to change that and it will be no longer the case that you only have to have been closer than two metres for 15 minutes? So the advice uh, that I have as of now is still that the, the definition of a contact is somebody who has, as you say, been uh, within two metres of somebody else for a period of uh, 15 minutes. Now, uh, that's the advice right now, but I would stress that we do continue to look on an ongoing basis, both at the scientific advice, we, we are learning more every day, as I said a moment ago, about how the virus operates in, in sunlight compared to you know, dark and, and heat compared to cold conditions, um, it, how it uh, behaves outdoors as opposed to indoors and, and the uh, you know, aerosol sort of transmission versus transmission from surfaces. So all of this we have to look at on an ongoing uh, basis and a policy like test, trace and isolate will also have to be flexible in terms of adapting to that. But, but the advice I have right now is that that uh, definition of a contact uh, that was uh, the one that we applied at the start of this is, is the advice as it is just now. You know, whether that will change in future, uh, I cannot say for certain, but if it does, we will adapt our approach accordingly. Do you want to say anything on that, Gregor? I think that sums up very nicely exactly the position that we're in just now. The science, the evidence, just now the, the advice that's coming from our advisory structures is that we should remain with that definition that you've outlined there, but we continue to, to kind of keep an eye on the emerging evidence. Yeah. Who is it that's giving that advice? Because clearly the scientists in South Korea are giving different advice. And I can't see any specific advice from the World Health Organization on this. I'm just given that we've seen, we've learned so much about it. Who is it that's advising you that a close contact is only if you've been 15 minutes closer than two our, meters? Our advice on these matters, as we've said before, is uh, in summary coming uh, through uh, the SAGE UK wide, but uh, also the, the advice and, and the evidence that comes out of the SAGE uh, process uh, is also looked at by our expert advisory group here in Scotland who will look at that for, uh, and not necessarily on this particular issue, any particular circumstances that would change that for Scotland um, and gives us the ability to interrogate it. So that is the route the advice comes. In terms of those who formulate that advice within these structures, uh, you know, they, they look at academic and scientific evidence from the world over uh, and formulate their opinions on the basis of that. So if there is learning from other countries, uh, such as the example uh, that you have cited, I would expect that to feed into that process and then emerge in, in advice for, uh, for, for governments. Um, again, to, to generalise a little bit, uh, you know, and this will vary depending on the nature of the issue we're talking about and, and how certain the scientific advice is, but, you know, ultimately on many of these things, what people like me have to do is look at all of the advice and apply our judgment to that. So if you take... Um, Face coverings, for example, you know, we got advice through that process that said there was, you know, some benefit of, of face coverings, but the science wasn't as clear on that issue as it might be on other issues. So I applied judgment to that and said, well, if there is some benefit we can get from that, then I think it's worth doing. So that's the kind of process of taking advice, applying judgment. And as that, as the, the scientific underpinning of that changes, so does the advice and perhaps so does the judgment. So these are all things that we keep under review on an ongoing basis. But I want to be clear on that point you you raised, the advice that has come to me on that point hasn't at this stage changed. Uh, Katie Hunter from BBC Scotland. Um, afternoon everyone, I'd like to ask about care home um, testing. I've got an email in front of me from a care home where there have been 16 deaths linked to Covid and it was sent out to, um, to residents' families and it talks about the number of staff it's had who's tested positive. And this email was sent on the 8th of May, so I think that was a week after you announced um, expanded the eligibility on care home testing. And it says it has a further seven staff who have symptoms but either don't meet the testing criteria or are awaiting results. Now, given this was sent on the 8th of May and we appear to have a care home where there have been 16 deaths, I'm just wondering how worried you are that not only symptomatic staff weren't being tested, but presumably asymptomatic staff weren't being tested either. Well, can I, I'll hand over to the health section in a minute, and I, 
I don't say this as any critical comment. It's, it's very difficult for us to comment on individual cases uh, where we, we don't know the details. So I would be very keen to look at that material. But be, let's, let me be very clear. And I said this, uh, I think I, I used the word, there should be no barriers to this when I made my opening remarks, that where a care home provider has uh, staff who are symptomatic, they should be uh, uh, advised to and uh, the, the care home provider should arrange for them to be tested and there should be no barriers to that and then in addition to that of course where there are cases within a care home all staff symptomatic or not should be tested so the policy there is clear um, we have to work with care home providers uh, on a whole range of these things to make sure the policy uh, that we are setting is being implemented in practice and we do that very rigorously and obviously as uh, the Health Secretary has just set out in relation to the care home in Sky, the care inspector that has a really important role to play here. So if, if there are any instances brought to our attention where policy is not translating into practice, we want to know about that so that we can take steps to rectify it. Jane, do you want to add? I'd add two things. First of all, to say we absolutely do want to know about it and we do act when we do know that. Uh, we have been really clear and my strong expectation is that in a care home where there is an active case, then all staff and all residents should be tested. Those staff or residents who test negative, uh, testing should be repeated at the appropriate intervals so that we, the point of all of this is to break the transmission. The point of it is to ensure that as many residents as possible and staff do not acquire the virus. There is a purpose to this testing, which is really important about the health of residents and staff. So it really does matter that all care home providers understand very clearly what our expectation is, that our NHS stands ready to actively help and support them and is already doing that in various ways across the country and is ready and prepared to do more. So the cooperation that we require in this area is really critical. And where there are instances where staff are being encouraged not to be tested, or there are examples such as the one we've just been given, I really do want to know about those as quickly as possible so that I can ensure that we act in that instance and redress the situation. Um, just to clarify that um, I did send, I have sent the details to the Scottish Government um, a couple of days ago. I, I don't expect they come across your desk, but if you okay. somebody does have the details of this okay, specific that's... instance somewhere. That, that is very helpful. Thank you. And thank you for doing that, because um, I was going to repeat my plea to the media generally. I'm not for a second suggesting that these stories shouldn't be reported. Of course they should. It's a really important part of, of the whole process we're, we're going through right now. But if, if you are hearing from care homes, individuals, anybody of things that don't seem right, then also let us know, because it's really important that we get on top of that. But if you have already done that, then um, that's very helpful. And, and I, I would certainly hope that that has already uh, been acted upon. Um, Lindsay, Hannah from Burr. Thanks, First Minister. Um, our listeners at Radio Clyde would like to know what's being advised to taxi and private hire drivers to make their vehicles safe for them to use. Today, we've heard from the chair of United's private hire drivers, and he says he's asked Glasgow City Council to allow them to install protective screens in their cars. But Glasgow City Council has told us they've now written to the Scottish Government to seek clarification on how licensed hire vehicles should operate right now. We're now being told that Uber drivers down south are having protective screens fitted in their vehicles. So I just wondered what the current advice is to taxi drivers and if you're planning on advising they have these screens fitted too. Um, I will uh, ask for uh, the relevant uh, part of the Scottish Government to make immediate contact with taxi drivers to give whatever advice they need now. As I said, I think a couple of days ago, we are uh, across a whole range of different sectors looking at what we need to do to secure safe workplaces. Now, obviously, for a lot of people, that is offices or, or factories uh, or schools or, or hospitals. But for many people, as you rightly say, that will be in cars and, and very small places. So we will uh, make contact. Obviously, the uh, licensing authorities for taxis are local authorities. Uh, but the Scottish Government's responsibility is to make sure that people have the advice and the guidance that they need. So we will make contact uh, with uh, those representing taxi drivers um, and uh, provide further information to you as well uh, when we've had the opportunity to do that. Uh, Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you'll no doubt be aware of the story in the Courier today about a fifth of all coronavirus tests in Scotland being unaccounted for. 
Um, you've explained earlier in your response to Peter about testing being a key factor in your decision, sorry, key factor in the uh, calculations for the R number. Um, and that's obviously then implicating uh, or impacting on uh, your decision making about lockdowns. Um, could the speed at which our lockdown is being lifted um, be different if you knew what the result of these 30,000 tests were? Um, no, I, I, I don't think that is the case at the moment. But but the, the issue, I, I think, um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that when I gave the update on testing a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I said that we had with with the, the tests that come through uh, are done by and come through the NHS in in Scotland uh, that are done by the NHS and processed through NHS labs. This is not an issue. We report every day the numbers of tests and positive, negative. The tests that are coming through the the UK wide uh, part of the system, which is the drive through centres with the uh, lab at Glasgow University, uh, we had uh, a slight delay in getting the results. I should say people tested were getting the results, uh, but the government had a slight delay. We are now getting that, uh, but there is a process of verification that is having to be done uh, to establish the positive negative breakdown of that. Now that has been done right now, and I am told that that process will be complete and this will not be an issue uh, within a matter of days. So it's been an issue uh, for that strand of testing, but it is well on the way to being resolved and it should not have an impact in any of our calculations around the R number or decisions we're making around lockdown. Uh, Alistair Grant from the Herald. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Um, the Scottish Government's Chief Statistician said at the technical briefing this morning, the Scotland may have a higher R number compared to the rest of the UK partly because of its older population, as well as a greater number of people with underlying health conditions. Is this something you're worried about in terms of how the virus has impacted on Scotland, and even in terms of how the lockdown might be lifted? Uh, for example, is this part of the reasoning behind why Scotland's policy is perhaps a bit more cautious than England, for example? Um, so I know the chief statistician will have explained the various things that will influence the R number and the, the the profile of the population, uh, demographics, underlying health conditions, that will have an impact. Any level of immunity uh, to the virus will have an impact on the R number and, and numbers of cases and deaths. So, you know, there, there may well be uh, a factor there, uh, which is what he has said. But equally, as I've said before, uh, there may just be the factor that our first cases were later and therefore we're a bit behind in terms of, of the infection curve. Uh, so it's really important that we understand that uh, as much as possible. In terms of the how that then feeds into the decisions about easing lockdown, I, I, I think I covered this a little bit in my response to Peter McMahon earlier on, and I, I actually talked a little bit about this in Parliament yesterday when uh, I think Willie Rennie uh, asked me a question. Uh, the the R number is important, um, but Overall, it's the relationship between our number and case incidence that, that matters most. So if we get the number of an incidence is the number of new cases every day, if we get that really low, then we can, to use a completely non-scientific terminology, afford to live with a, an R number that's a bit higher than we can if the incidence is still really high. So what we need to do is get the, the case numbers down as far as possible, uh, hopefully get our number our down a bit as well, and then have that relationship in a better place. The, the problem for us right now is that incidence is still a bit too high and R is still a bit too close to one, and it's that combination uh, that is, is the problem. And, you know, that, so to, to come back to your, your question, why am I being cautious? Because all of the data right now tells me that we're in quite a fragile position uh, because case numbers are still too high and R is still close to one. You could live with the latter if you didn't have the former, but we've got both right, or you could more live with the latter if you didn't have the former, but we've got both right now. We need to get that into a more stable and a more secure position before we do anything meaningful in terms of, of lifting restrictions. And, you know, ultimately, you know, these, uh, these are judgments that are very, very much informed by the science and the science that I've just uh, unexpertly uh, explained there. But ultimately, as I said a moment ago, we have to make those judgments and I have to, and the government has to make those judgments. And given the uncertainties around this that all governments are dealing with, if if we err at all, I want that to be in the side of caution so that the, the price we pay for getting it slightly wrong is that we all live with lockdown for a bit longer rather than the price we pay being people unnecessarily dying um, because 
not having people dying is what I think should drive all of our decisions here. And that's why, as I say, I make no apology for it. At the moment, I, I would rather be a bit cautious in the interest of saving as many lives as possible. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Mail. Hello, good afternoon. Just to follow up on your answer there, you, you said that you would like to see that our number fall, uh, fall slightly before relaxing some of the measures. Um, the COVID advisory group member said today that it has been relatively stable throughout lockdown at 0 0.7 to 1, um, and, and that it's unlikely to fall until immunity rises. So how exactly do you, do you think that our number can begin to fall? What, what needs to happen? I, th I think what, um, and I, obviously I wasn't at that technical briefing, but I've had some feedback from it. I think the point that was being made there is that, you know, there's what we've done with lockdown has brought the R number from where it was at the start, which was probably in excess of three, perhaps substantially in excess of three, down to where it is now. And it's really important that we continue to comply right now to, to stop it going up again. I think what uh, the member of the expert group was saying, as I understand it, is that we're not, we're not proposing new social distancing measures on top of what we've already got to try to force it down that way. But other things we are doing right now is very much about trying to get it down further. And that is particularly the steps we're taking in care homes, steps we're taking to try to stop infection uh, transmitting within hospitals, uh, continued compliance with lockdown and increasingly the, the uh, test trace and isolate support that will help us to get it down a bit more as well. But I, I imagine the overall point that was made by... Uh, the member of the expert group and the chief statistician is the one I've just made, that R is really important, but it can't be seen in isolation. It is that relationship between the R number and the incidence of cases that is most important. If you look at uh, Germany right now, um, Germany has, since it started to ease restrictions, seen some fluctuation in its R number. And at one stage earlier this week, they thought it had gone over one again. I think they think it's now come slightly below one again, but it's still hovering, it's, based on what I read, quite close to one, but their incidence of cases is very low. So they, they can live with that higher R number as long as their incidence is low. If we get our incidence down, then an R number being uh, a bit closer to one is not as big a worry as that is if your incidence of cases is still high. It's very, it's very complicated and technical, but it's that the relationship that matters most, and we've got to get that balance better than it is right now, which is why we need to stick with these measures and do everything we're doing in care homes, for example, to get to that position. Um, I'll hand over to Gregor, who can probably explain all this in a slightly more technical way than I've just managed. So, so I think anything that, that you know, there are still things that we can do that will influence our just now, and, and the First Minister has already outlined some of those in terms of how we make sure that the, <clears throat> the various places where we're currently seeing this virus transmitting are, 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 are brought under uh, control, whether that be within the community, whether that be in the hospitals, whether that be in other institutions like, like care homes. So, so, so gaining uh, a greater degree of control there will help to influence the R number. But really importantly, what it will also do is it will drive down this new incidence number, the incidence rate uh, for the virus as well. And that will all influence uh, where we are uh, as well. And I think if we if we have that, that kind of um, two-pronged attack in mind at all times, um, what it does is it creates as the additional headroom so that we can make sure that any further changes that we make to start to change the restrictions that people are experiencing, there is much less likelihood that any subsequent rise in R is going to lead us into a, a, a rise in, in, in the, the kind of numbers that we're seeing spreading in the community, which would be uncontrollable and, and which are, in particular our TTIS system would be able to, uh, we wouldn't be able to cope with. I mean, maybe the, the simple, I, because I, I'm not a clinician and I'm not a scientist, I find the, the kind of simpler ways of understanding this uh, obviously quite helpful. If, if you've got, and I'm using purely illustrative numbers right now, if your incidence is 1,000 new cases a day and your R number is 1, that means that 1,000 new cases a day will infect 1,000 more. But if your incidence is 10 cases a day and your R number is 1, then those 10 will just infect uh, 10 more. So... So the numbers of people becoming infected with an R number of one is, is much fewer at the lower incidence than at the higher incidence. So R is really, really important. And the lower you get it below one, the better. But that crucial relationship with where you get your incidence of cases is what, what really matters. And as Gregor said, as we go forward, how we will keep 
incidents suppressed, uh, we hope, is through test, trace and isolate. And although we're building, you know, quite a substantial capacity to do that, we have to be sure that that capacity, just as we don't want our NHS capacity to be overwhelmed, that we don't overwhelm TTI capacity. So the, keeping that incidence low is, is really important and the relationship between the two is important. So as I say, it's very technical, um, but hopefully uh, that allows people just to understand uh, what it is we're trying to achieve. Andy Nicol from The Sun. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? You, you, have to, you have to speak in order for us to hear you. I'm speaking, but I... I can hear you, so carry on speaking. Okay, good. Um, there have been a number of questions put down in Holyrood regarding comments from the clinical director, Dr Leach, uh, who said it was fine to go to a concert, that the over 70s and those with pre-existing health conditions should not cut off family contact but increase it, that schools don't help us with the spread of the virus, that it might be appealing to hunker down, but that doesn't work. So when you reopen, the vulnerable will be hit again. Uh, and he also suggested that we would have 1.2 million tests carried out. Did you overrule him in these remarks in this policy? Do you still have confidence in him? And when will we get the 1.2 million tests? Um, no, I didn't overrule him. And I think the answer to this question is actually quite straightforward. Um, because those comments will stretch back to the very start of this epidemic. And I, I don't know if you were listening to some of my earlier answers. We have learned almost every day new things about this virus and we've adapted our response accordingly. And, and things that we might have thought earlier on, we now uh, don't think because the evidence and the science around this virus, which is still, you know, as I say, around 150 or something like that, days old. It, it would be, I think, a, a really irresponsible government that simply for the sake of uh, not allowing uh, the media or the politicians to uh, use the traditional, ah, but you said this before, to kind of stick with what you said when the science was saying one thing and not move on when it's saying something else. So yes, I do have confidence in Jason Leach. I think uh, most people watching will probably think he's done an absolutely sterling job in explaining some of this in a really understandable way uh, for the population. And anybody who thinks right now uh, media or politician that this is some kind of game of gotcha. Uh, we're, we're all learning as we go and we're trying to adapt our responses as we go. And on our testing, um, we're, we're building up our testing capacity uh, all the time. We, uh, I guess the 1.2 million depends over what period of time you're talking about, but we are, uh, we've gone from having a capacity to do 350 tests a day to right now having a capacity that's in excess of 10,000 a day and it is continuing to grow um, and it will continue to grow as we go into uh, test trace and isolate. Uh, Sev Carell from The Guardian. Thanks very much, First Minister. Um, just going back to these questions about the R number and what the three statisticians and epidemiologists told us this morning, one of the points they also made was that any easing at all of the lockdown is likely to see a pressure upwards on the R rate, even while you have um, programmes which will suppress the R rate, such as increased testing in care homes or hospitals. So if we're putting increasing reliance at the moment on your TTI programme, can you give us an update on exactly what, where the TTI programme is at? Has it, be, has it started? How many tests have been carried out under that TTI? What's the position? Um, so uh, on the first part of uh, your question, uh, that is right. Uh, and I, I think I said this when, I, when we published our uh, second paper going through our decision making here. When you start to ease these lockdowns, say, say you open schools, for example, um, the impact that will have on the R number is pretty much the same whenever you do it. Uh, but what is important is that when you do it, your incidence of cases is lower so that so that the, the increase in R is operating on, on a lower baseline. So you're, you're effectively wanting as much headroom when you start to ease restrictions as possible so that it doesn't run out of control again. And when you get incidence down and start to do that, TTI is part. It's not the only thing you do to keep it down continued social distancing uh, of some form will be important for a long time to come. But TTI becomes a really important part of the approach you take. In terms of um, 
where we are with TTI. We'll, we'll give more of a, an update on this shortly. Um, there is contact tracing happening um, in uh, certain circumstances right now. So the example of the Sky Care Home, uh, there was contact tracing, testing and contact tracing happening uh, there. But the focus of our testing right now is on the three priorities that I set out in my uh, opening remarks, uh, treating those who are seriously ill and most vulnerable, uh, making sure key workers are not non unnecessarily off work and surveillance and, and assessing the spread. Progressively, we will move from that into TTI. Uh, we will have capacity in place through testing, contact tracing and support for isolation. Uh, by the end of this month, it will allow us to make a shift into that. But I would caution against, as I've said before, uh, thinking of this as one day we have no TTI capacity and the next day we have the full capacity, we will scale this up and we may have to continue to scale it up as we move on. But in terms of where we are, in terms of uh, the, the, the build-up of that capacity, we'll set out more progress on that in uh, fairly short order. Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, First Minister... The latest figures have been published today by the government on um, business um, support grants. Mm. It has prompted some concerns from the Federation of Small Businesses about um, the, the slowing rate of this money being distributed to smaller businesses. Um, I think 59,000 have received grants so far, but they reckon a backlog of maybe around um, 20,000. And just over half of the 1.2 billion that's been earmarked for businesses has so far been distributed. So uh, given that this was seen as lifeline support for businesses during lockdown, are you concerned about potential backlogs in the administration of this? Uh, local authorities are uh, processing these applications and are working really hard and doing a really good job. All of this money will get to the businesses who are eligible for it and it's really important that happens as quickly as possible and be working with local authorities to make sure that it's happening as quickly as is feasible. Um, your figures are, are broadly right. There's so far £679 million been paid out to uh, 59,000 uh, businesses. There's a total number of applications of 78,000. So uh, the, the 59,000 of those have received money, but this will be a moving uh, picture literally every single day as more of these applications are processed. And yes, local authorities are trying to get through that as quickly as possible uh, because it matters to businesses. I know not just that they get the money, but they get the money in a, uh, a short, as short a time scale as possible. So I know local authorities are continuing to work uh, to get through all of these applications as speedily as they can. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. Um, Andrew Wilson has written for The Times today that large government bonds should be issued to industries and sectors that will need investment coming out of the pandemic, universities being the most obvious example. In exchange, those sectors would have to then carry out large-scale reforms. Is this the kind of economic policy that you are considering for you know, after the, the virus has passed largely and have there been any conversations with the Treasury about this and how it may work? Um, conversations with Treasury are ongoing on a whole range of things. Um, we have made clear and, uh, you know, I think other organisations, uh, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong on this, but Fraser Allender uh, Institute have, have made the point previously that the current fiscal powers of the Scottish Parliament are probably not sufficient to deal with the uh, the, the reality now and into the future of, of this crisis. So we want to have uh, constructive discussions about how we, we change uh, those powers in order to, to better equip us. Um, and that will be a, an ongoing discussion. I think it's really welcome that we hear people come forward with ideas. Don't uh, tell Andrew this. I've not had the chance to uh, read his uh, article in full yet. I will do so uh, later. But the kind of ideas that he's talking about, you know, as part of a number of ideas, you know, we've had uh, people talking about universal basic income as well. Um, so all of these things, we're in unprecedented times and we will all have to think of new ways and, and different ways and better ways perhaps than we've uh, had in the past of, of dealing with and responding uh, to what this crisis means for us. One thing I think is absolutely um, certain in my mind is that we cannot, we must not have the kind of austerity approach uh, from 
Westminster that we saw in the wake of the financial crash because we still see the damage of that today. So we mustn't allow that mistake to be repeated. So the kind of ideas that I know Andrew has written about today and, and others will bring forward uh, all have to be, I think, uh, considered and taken forward in that spirit. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks, First Minister. Um, just going back to TTI, um, figures the government provide, your government provided last night, it said 3,500 people had expressed an interest in the, um, the contact tracing rules following the recruitment ads that had been launched. But just given not all these people will be either suitable or, or available to take up those jobs, how confident are you of actually meeting the 2,000 uh, goal by the end of this month? As we scale this up over time, health boards are already working to, uh, within their own uh, current staff base to uh, retrain people to do contact tracing. So this is an ongoing process and the recruitment is, is over and above that. And I'm confident that we will uh, get the people we need and have the ability to scale that up as, as we require it. So I'm, I'm not, in fact, uh, rather than being concerned, I'm actually quite heartened by the degree of interest there's been since we put that advert out uh, at the start of this week. So um, I think that shows uh, the appetite there is there for people to be involved in this. We'll also, in in due course, when the time is right, uh, there will be lots of public information for the public about how TTI works. Because as I said uh, when we published the paper on it a couple of weeks ago, you know, it's for government to build the capacity we need for this system, but it only works if the public both understand what we're asking you to do and are prepared to do it, both in coming forward for testing, sharing details of your contacts and being willing to isolate for periods where that is required. So this is going to be another big national effort that is required to make this kind of system work. Uh, Mjordiki from the Financial Times. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you've mentioned the interaction of the incidence and the R number. Uh, can you give us any sense at all of what sort of incidence and what sort of R number you think would allow you to match, for example, the easing of lockdown that's been uh, enacted in England? And the, um, uh, do you think currently Scotland's incidence of the infection is substantially different from that in England? Um, I I don't have the figures in front of me for incidents in England. Um, I, as I've said before, uh, what, what we think is the R number might be a bit higher. Um, I'm not going to cite figures right now if it's got to be X hundred or X thousand. Experts will continue to advise me in the days ahead of where they think uh, those are getting to and the balance between them and the relationship. And I'll be, you know, as, as I get that advice, I'll be open uh, with, with the public about that. But right now, the, the fragility of the, the situation says to me that further caution is required. I would, I would remind people, and I, I, again, I, I hope people will take uh, me in, in good faith here when I'm not making a political point here. I think all governments have to make their own judgment. But you know, there has been some commentary um, about Scotland departing from the position in England uh, or, or departing from the four nations approach. Actually, three of the four nations in the UK, England, uh, sorry, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are pretty much sticking with the stay at home message right now. England, and this is where I'm not criticising, it's for the government there to decide what is right, has decided to move a little bit quicker. So we'll continue to judge these things uh, carefully. I will continue to uh, take the advice that experts give me, but ultimately I will have to apply my judgment to that. There will be risks. Whenever we start to more meaningfully ease this lockdown, there will be risks because this is all very uncertain. But judgments have to be made about the balance of risk, and my judgment at the moment is easing up significantly. The, the risk of that would be too great given where both incidents and our number are right now. Uh, Andrew Lehrman from The National. Thanks, First Minister. I'd like to ask about the uh, the picnics, these so-called unified peaceful mass gatherings planned for Saturday in parks all over Scotland to protest the lockdown. Um, do you want to give a message for those thinking of going along um, uh, and those attending would be breaking the law here? Would you expect police to get involved? Uh, and perhaps more generally, are you worried that as the lockdown continues and as the weather gets warmer, uh, the willingness of people to obey the restrictions becomes more afraid? Uh, and how do you address that? Um, I, I have recognised all along, and I, I always make a point of saying it because I know it gets more true every day, that 
this is really difficult for everybody. It's, it's not easy to live under these restrictions. It's not particularly pleasant to be living under these restrictions. So I know people's patience is getting frayed and people get frustrated. I think that's true all of the time. It's undoubtedly truer on days where the sun is shining. Um, but my, in my experience, and certainly my anecdotal experience, uh, but also the, you know, as you would expect, the Scottish Government does opinion tracking and, and uh, polling to understand where public opinion is all in this. I think the support for doing the right thing is very, very high. You know, people are frustrated with it, but understand why they're being asked to do these things and want to make sure they continue to do the right thing. And, and I think it's important for me to keep saying, I will not keep these restrictions in place for longer than necessary. Please trust me when I say that. But the other side of that is, please trust me when I say right now it is necessary in order to stop this virus running out of control again. In terms of the the so-called protest that I know uh, there has been material uh, circulating on social media, I'd say two things related. Firstly, anybody that goes to a, a picnic in the park uh, right now will be breaking the law. You know, gatherings outside of household gatherings of more than two people are not allowed. And it's not for me to direct the police and how they would respond to that, but I've got every confidence that the police will uh, apply and enforce the law. So you'll be breaking the law, which is one good reason not to do it. But the other, perhaps even more important reason not to do it is you'll be putting people's lives at risk. Um, so if anybody out there watching this is even remotely tempted to, you know, sort of go to some uh, illegal gathering in a park this weekend because you're fed up with lockdown, what I'd say to you is I understand you're fed up with lockdown. We're all fed up with it, but we're having to do it for the right reasons. And if you do that, then it is not an exaggeration to say you could be putting people's lives at risk. So please... Don't do it. You know, we're all in this for the same reason, to stop people dying unnecessarily. So don't be that person that uh, goes and knowingly puts somebody's life on the line. It's not worth it, so please don't do it. Uh, Tom Peter came from the P&J. Um, good afternoon. Um, going back to the home farm care home on Sky, I, I appreciate that the findings of the Care Commission are, are not public yet, but... Can you give some indication of how concerned you have been by what you've heard about the running of the care home? And I, I know the health secretary uh, did mention something on this, but is it, can you give a, a breakdown on how many people are involved in terms of being brought into the care home? Look, I th I'm going to hand over to the health secretary and uh, she'll, she, she won't necessarily be able to give all that information right now, but take it from the steps that are being taken, uh, that that should be an indication that there is real concern there and we want to make sure that everything has been done to give the assurance that people would want. All I would add to that is, um, as the First Minister said, in terms of, of how seriously we take it, having diverted, as we are right to do, uh, significant NHS resources uh, to ensure that the care home is uh, running with a, a rota of staff to residents that it should have, that proper infection prevention and control is in place and that care is also in place uh, for the residents there. That's, a, I think, a clear indication that we take it very seriously indeed. In terms of the absolute numbers, uh, I don't have those. Uh, what is the case is that we are um, making up shortfalls in the staffing rota, providing uh, clear uh, nursing and clinical guidance uh, in, a in a practical sense on the ground, as well as ensuring that there is overall the leadership there that is required to deliver uh, all those results that I have said about the quality of the residents' experience and the care. Uh, that will be uh, people from our NHS working alongside staff who already work in that care home because we know that in that care home, as in many others, the staff who work there are very committed to doing the right thing. So we have supplemented that and uh, we will continue to do that for as long as we think it is required. Thank you. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, the Scottish Government has issued a statement this morning saying that it became aware of all 25 cases at the Nike conference in Edinburgh by the 9th of March. Um, I just wanted some clarification about how those cases were classified within the um, daily reports that the Scottish Government issues on um, case numbers. Um, the Health Secretary said the other day that the first Scottish case was, was categorised in 
Ayrshire or Grampian, I, which I assume was the place of residence of that individual. And I assume that would be applied to the, to the eight Scottish cases. But I wasn't sure how the other cases, the non-Scottish cases, the, the rest of the RUK and the foreign cases would have been classified. Would, they, would, would those figures have come out under Lothian? Or would they have not have been included because the people involved were not resident in Scotland? It would have, if, if what I'm about to say here is not strictly accurate, we'll come back and correct it, but it, it would depend on where they, they were confirmed. If, if they were confirmed in Scotland, they would appear in the Scottish cases, uh, but if they were confirmed um, back in their own country, they would be reported through the figures in, in that country. Um, and, you know, all of the normal protocols uh, here were, were followed. Uh, as I said the other day, patient confidentiality was, was a real issue and, and presumably an issue for all countries uh, in terms of, of reporting cases. And, and just to, to kind of illustrate that, there was, I think, in total 10 people from Scotland at this conference. I think 70 or so overall, but only 10 of them were Scottish. So if we, uh, when, as we did, you know, I think it was even on the 3rd of March, we uh, got notice of the first case. It was reported through our figures on the 4th of March. So, you know, all of these cases were reported. But as we said, you know, patient from uh, patient X from Health Board Y has been confirmed as having the virus. Had we gone on to say where they got the virus, we would have been identifying that person probably because in all likelihood, there was only going to be one person in the whole of that health board area who was at the event. So when you're dealing with such small numbers, patient confidentiality is really important. But all of the cases confirmed in Scotland were reported through our normal reporting procedures. And that would have been, you know, given the detail of the health board uh, that they were in. But if cases were confirmed not in Scotland, they would uh, go through their own country's reporting process. Uh, I'll just clarify then that there would have been some cases where, that were contracted in Edinburgh at this conference that were not uh, basically included in the figures and therefore the public were not aware of at all. Um, look, I, I want to double check the detail of your answer before I, I, I give you an answer uh, because it's important that it is accurately. But if, if the per person had left Scotland before they were confirmed as having the virus, then that would go through their uh, normal uh, country's reporting, uh, which would be the normal way that, that these things uh, work with any uh, infection outbreak or, or any uh, virus, not just this one. Uh, Vivian Aitken from the Daily Record. Question, First Minister. Um, I was almost at, also at the briefing this morning, <clears throat> and your expert said at that time that before lockdown, the R number was actually about between four and six, which was much higher than, than we've been told previously. Um, but said very quickly it got down, as we've heard already today, to between 0 0.7 and 1. However, they've said that at no point would it get any lower than that because everything that had, could be done within the community had been done. So you've been saying to us to stay at, at home because that will drive the R number lower. They've said that it won't, but they've said that what you've introduced very recently to do with hospitals and care homes would help drive it down. So my question is, if you had got grip on the care home crisis earlier, would the R number have come down earlier? And would we have been seeing some easing of lockdown restrictions earlier than we currently are? Uh, no, I think is the short answer to that. I think that is a, a, an over uh, simplification. Look, I've, I've gone, I don't know if you've, you've been able to hear my previous answers, but I've, I've, I've gone through this already in some detail, so I don't, I don't want to go over all of the detail again. It is not the case that uh, lockdown is not still important. If, if we lift lockdown, suddenly the R number will shoot up again. Um, I think the point that was being made is we're not at this stage proposing even tighter restrictions in order to... Uh, get it down more through that kind of social distancing but it is really important what we're doing right now to avoid it going up the, the steps that will have a bearing on the r number now are what we are doing in care homes hospitals and increasingly tti but i will make that point again about that relationship between r and the incidence it's that relationship that is the crucial thing uh, rather than seeing both in isolation uh, last question today is from a uh, Terry Murden from Daily Business. Good afternoon. Um, 20 representatives of house building companies, including uh, Carla, Barrett, Stuart Milne, Persimmon, have all written to you asking for guidance on a phased return to work. 
given that they have uh, reached agreement with the uh, medical authorities in the UK government to work safely in England, uh, an area from Newcastle to Newcastle, from Newquay to Newcastle, uh, far greater than uh, the landmass of Scotland. Uh, wh why is Scotland's advice so markedly different? And why are you not satisfied that uh, these companies and others like garden centres uh, can't operate in the same way here? Um, well, we are working with the construction sector right now um, in one of 14 uh, work streams to get uh, safe uh, sectoral workplace guidance uh, uh, agreed. And, and that is work that's ongoing with uh, businesses and with trade unions. Uh, the construction sector are uh, very closely involved in that. Uh, and we, I would anticipate that construction will be one of the you know, the first sectors that will see uh, that guidance. Uh, but we're doing that with all uh, sectors of, of the economy. Why, why am I not doing certain things that have been done in England? Because my judgment is that it's not safe to do them yet. And ultimately, my responsibility as First Minister is to the people of Scotland to make uh, the best judgments I can to keep the population safe. I, you know, do not question the right of the UK government to take different decisions uh, that they think uh, can be done safely. But my judgment is that we have to be very cautious right now in order that this virus doesn't run out of control. Uh, and at the weekend when I announced the change uh, to lift the limit on uh, exercise so that it is no longer just once a day, I said that over the course of uh, this week, and we'll uh, probably report back on this uh, at the, the start of next week, we will be looking at uh, outdoor, ex outdoor activity more generally, and I also specifically said garden centres. But I, again, I'm going to make no apology for taking this carefully and cautiously with public health and saving lives absolutely at the centre of what I do. I know how important it is to get the economy up and running again. I want to see that as much as anybody. But if we do things too quickly and this virus takes off again, uh, not only will more people die unnecessarily, which I'm not prepared to take the risk of, uh, but equally we'll all end up in lockdown a lot longer and that will not be good for the economy. So getting these decisions right is really, really important. Right, that uh, concludes today's questions. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us today and for staying with us. Thank you to the journalists. Thanks to Jean and Gregor and Anna, our sign language interpreter. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, continuing to comply with this guidance. Uh, it is really important. Um, all of these discussions we've had today, they're very technical and uh, we, we all, those of us who are not from a scientific background, we, we struggle a, a little bit with the, the technicalities of it all. But in summary, uh, we're going in the right direction here. We just need to go a bit further in order to have the confidence that when we release these measures or start to release these measures, we don't undo all of that progress and put ourselves right back to square one. So that's why I'm asking for your continued patience. I know it's really hard, but please understand that it is having a positive effect. So my thanks to all of you. We'll be back here tomorrow at uh, the same time of 12.30. Thank you.